This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. While tensions between the U.S. and Russia continue to heat up, one group of filmmakers has found a way to strengthen ties between Russia and the United States through a common bond, their disabilities. A new film premiering tonight in New York follows the media-enabled musketeers, American and Russian filmmakers with disabilities, as they make original films to tell their stories. This is a clip from the documentary All for One, featuring two of our guests, John Novick and Ben Rosloff, speaking in Moscow after learning about the struggles disabled people face there. The things we saw today have been really upset. In the United States, they allowed disabled people to go to regular schools. As for Russia, they don't. They just keep them in special schools. It's sad. Yeah? You know, it's like, it's like saying no disabled people allowed. It's like uh, no dogs allowed. I remember Ben said the, the, the nicest thing to me. You looked at me and said, do you think there's a way I can lift you up and maybe someone else can help put your legs straight and move your legs and we can get you back walking again. Maybe, you know, well, let's just test. Can you try to move your leg while on the wheelchair? My injury is in my spinal cord. You're doing everything you can, like mentally, mm -hmm. but nothing's happening. If someone came up to you and, and told you like, okay, like today I'm gonna, I'm gonna cure your autism, like, how would you convey to them? What would you say explaining how hard it is? Well, it's not going to be that easy. As a person who has autism, how, I want to speak cruel. I want to speak I want to speak, speak clearly. Clearly, sorry. Yeah, it's it's pro it's a problem. You are doing everything you can, and you know, in fact, I admire that. That's Andrew Angulo. He's a filmmaker from Los Angeles, together with Ben Rosloff and John Novick, Novick in the film All for One, that's directed by John Alpert. And they've recently turned from Russia. Um, John Novick, if you can talk about um, what you learn from your dialogue with Russian filmmakers and people in Russia. I mean, here you are doing mm -hmm. outreach for the de Blasio administration around uh, accessibility and just the lives of people with disabilities in New York. Mm -hmm. What did you learn in Russia? Well, I think that um, examining, let's say, the two of them parallel to each other, that I'd say, as far as disability civil rights, we are further along in the United States. And what we're seeing right now in Russia is, I think, a lot of grassroots, a lot of parents with children that have disabilities kind of taking the lead because they are empowered to do so, that they must, and that every inch needs to be fought for. Whereas here, we have, you know, a little bit more... I guess resources, not only from the nonprofit sector, but branches of government. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal, you know, federal law passed in 1990 to protect the rights of people with disabilities. So I just think that there is a lot of local grassroots uh, and a lot of passion that I think is something that was really enlightening to take back to the United States. Now, talk about where you grew up and your sure. parents made sure you were in regular public schools. Yeah, in, in public school. So I uh, I am a little person. You know, I have achondroplastic dwarfism, but my parents do not, and that's actually very common. Achondroplasia is a genetic uh, mutation that occurs, and for this reason, my parents had no experience with this, and when I was growing up, they wanted to make sure that I was as independent as possible, that I was, you know, attending public school, um, and I was in public school. I was in, you know, I, I wasn't in a, in a particular class classroom, I was with other people that, uh, you know, didn't have any disabilities, at least seemingly. And as a result of this, uh, a form of accommodation that I had was I had an aide. It was a, a, a woman, her name was Mrs. Castellano, and if she's watching, uh, shout out to Mrs. Castellano. <laughs> uh, but she basically was with me for anything that I needed, whether it was um, accommodations for, you know, not being able to carry all of my books, or a little bit of help organizing. Actually, when I was younger, I had a lot of difficulty holding a pencil, so I needed someone to take notes for me. So she was a scribe. I still tried because I had to get that practice in, but ultimately she was able to provide uh, more 
Oh, so um, she was with you until what grade? Well, she was with me until sixth grade, and then in seventh grade, I had a new aide, and I kind of tra um, had different aides every year until the end of ninth grade. So my sophomore year of high school, I was the first time I didn't have an aide. It was a time when I was completely independent. I could take my own notes. I could carry my own books. I could make my own way. And, and what did that a, feel like? It felt amazing. It felt, honestly, it did. I remember uh, just feeling awesome i remember because it just kind of felt like you know you know i was very thankful and especially now hindsight i was very thankful to have this assistance and i don't think i understood the the, the immense help it was at the time but at the same time you know as a kid you're just like i want to hang out with my friends and i don't want <laughs> i don't want anybody like you know i don't want teachers around me and it was always that was that person where uh you know like there was always somebody a piece of a faculty member with me so it felt like i couldn't truly be a kid so i just felt like there was this balance Balance between it, and when I finally was, you know, deemed independent enough to not have an aide, it was just hmm. great. Ben, you also went to public school. Um, you did a film that is excerpted in this film on autism. Yes. Um, talk about your parents' decision and what that meant to you. You grew up here in New York. Well, I, I was born. I was originally born in Queens, and then a few years later, I moved to Great Neck when I was like three or four. Actually, I. Was I think I was three at that time, and um, like before, like I didn't go to the same school as my as my older sibling. My brother went to well in Great Neck, so I was sent to a special school that time due to me being autism. Like that time, I didn't know that I was autistic. I didn't know that I had a disability. I thought I was non-disabled, like everyone else, and. I mean, I didn't know what autism was that time, so I, so I was sent to a school that was a special school that was not part of Great Neck, but down east in Long Island, somewhere in Long Island, New York. But, however, my parents eventually fought for me to go to a regular school. So yeah, I started like. I started going to a regular school before I turned six years old. Actually, I was like in first grade, so I thought my I thought my family did a great job about that, and it was a good skill for me to get used to being like people who are non-disabled. It's a perfect way to fit in with people who who are non-disabled. Now, this is part two of our conversation. And after we finished part one, you said, there's a critical point I wanted to make that I didn't get to make yet. And this was when we were talking about you going to Russia. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When I was in, a, when I was in Russia, well, I got to meet new people there, not just be at the film festival, but meet new people and learn all the things they do, what we don't do in America. And... Um, and it's pretty interesting, actually. And um, but the thing that ups that, I were, that upset it to me there is like, like when we brought Andrew Angelo, uh, like with us. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's the uh, clip like, we just saw of the three of you in your hotel yep. room talking. Yeah. Um, well, when we brought him, like most of the ramps and the wheel, like there was no wheelchair access accessible. So like we had to keep lifting him upstairs and downstairs into every building. And um, also... Well, let, me, let me go to this point, because we have a clip from your film, All for One, exploring how accessible various parts of Moscow and New York are for people with disabilities. This is a clip um, when you arrive at Moscow's Red Square. Andrew Angelo uh, navigates the square in his wheelchair. The, uh, it's a little tricky. You gotta watch all the little cracks. The front wheel can get caught and I'm be flying forward. So as much as I can, I try to do a little wheelie coming down. There are good efforts to try to make Moscow accessible, but being able to go down something like this would be extremely sketchy. I would be quite afraid. We're going to take our chances with this 20-lane highway instead. This cop is shutting down Moscow to keep us from getting killed.
Okay, this was unbelievable. That was media-enabled Musketeers filmmaker Andrew Angulo navigating Red Square in Moscow from a wheelchair. In the clip, a police officer escorts him and others across, to say the least, a multi-lane, very busy street, because facilities in and around Red Square are not easily accessible. Um, John, if you can take us further on this trip, I mean, sure. and what happened? I mean, so, what he had to do to get into these subways in a wheelchair well, and across we never, the street? Well, we never rode the subway, first of all, and because <clears throat> it's not accessible. But um, we basically, so there, there's these, so the scene that you just saw was uh, us looking at these <coughs> underground tunnels that they have. So large highway, as you saw, there would be underground tunnels that go through, and their answer to accessibility was slapping on these plastic bars that were expected to catch the wheels of a wheelchair, but it's at steeper than like a 45 degree angle. <laughs> it was you actually, steeper than a ski slope yeah, it was, in the But also it goes down and then it goes flat and it goes down. So basically you have like an X Games thing happening <laughs> where if somebody were to go down, they would presumably fly off after it tapers off and then... I, I don't know. You can actually, there's actually a video of someone in, in, in Russia, I obviously, I don't know what it's called, but somebody who actually tries, like a person who does not use a wheelchair, just getting in one to see what would happen if I did it. And then just constantly, it's like a two minute video of just Falling. incredible wipeouts <laughs> of like if someone actually did it. But this was a common theme that we ran into where there would be an attempt to, uh, like an accessible attempt to address, um, issues within infrastructure, but they inherently required the assistance of another person. So if you want to make something truly accessible, the person with the disability needs to be able to navigate it themselves. And this was a theme that we kept seeing, that we constantly needed to assist Andrew and go through, um, there, he, there was a lot of challenges. Because of the infrastructure, he needed to be, you know, assisted into buildings, I, down sidewalks, everything. Now, that's Moscow. I mean, you're in charge of outreach here in New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. Our colleague at Democracy Now!, Robbie Karen, uses a wheelchair. He's mm -hmm. constantly posting, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get into subways and mm -hmm. elevators broken down. We're at 23rd Street mm -hmm. here. There is no, there is no elevator. Mm -hmm. um, but what it means to get by in and what efforts are being made? Well, I mean, so for the MTA, the MTA is actually state run. So that is not run by the mayor's office. There are, you know, I think forward attempts with the recent appointment of Andy Byford. He seems to be taking a, a very proactive um, stance on not only improving the entire subway system, but specifically accessibility into subway systems. So everything is being built new. Previously, I think on the on the um, on the uh, we we saw a clip of uh, Commissioner Victor Khaleesi talking about the age of the subway system, which provides a lot of issues because there's the the size of it and then the the age of it and the difficulty in actually getting down and providing access. But you look at anything that's being built new, there's accessibility built into it. The Second Avenue subway station already has accessibility built into it with elevators. And as we continue, we will continue doing that. But we're looking for solutions and how to fix it and continue and build onto it to make sure that there is accessibility considered. Um, John Alpert, um, you've made many films. This film, for you, what it meant? Um, As a differently abled person yourself, I mean, I think that issue of, and I think Ben raised it, and also John. You know, people have all sorts of disabilities, whether you see them or you don't. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sensitive to this because uh, my father, for the last 20 years of his life, was severely disabled, uh, had mobility problems, uh, and and his identity changed from what it was to a person with a disability. That's how people looked at him. Um, the opportunities that he had had earlier in his life before he became disabled uh, disappeared. Um, it, it affected our whole family. I think everybody's family has somebody who has a disability in it. And I think that all of us, at some point in our lives, we're going to become disabled. My dad, who was in a wheelchair, said, when I said to him, what is different for you being in a wheelchair, he said, no one looks at me anymore. He said, people actually avert their eyes. You think you're being polite, he said, when a person looks away from you? He said, can you imagine going down the street? Usually you make eye contact, you nod yeah. to someone. Everyone's quickly looking in another direction. You no longer make, uh, you know, have person-to-person -person contact, he said. If I may, actually, John, you touched on a very interesting point. So this idea that as, as quality of life increases and as technology increases, everybody is living longer. And 
we are, at one point or another, experiencing disability. You don't have to be born with a disability to experience it, whether it be temporary or as you get older, if you experience issues walking, issues hearing, issues seeing, and develop a disability over time. And I think it's important that we you know, plan for this. So we, you know, we're thinking about disability, thinking about um, what disability means, and ultimately, I think you can actually attribute it more to the environment around you. I think with proper accommodations, as we talked about Andrew, talking about um, the difficulties that he faced in Moscow, he doesn't have a disability if his environment allows him to move freely throughout it. And I think that it's just kind of important to note that, that there's this stigma around disability, avoiding eye contact and things like that. But I think with a properly accessible environment, that can be a total game changer. And Ben, as we wrap up, because I know you have to head off for work and you're very diligent about getting to work on time, um, why you got involved in the media as a form of expression for you? Well, um, when I was in middle school, there was a, there was, I, there was like a TV studio and I, and um, so um, a teacher named Mr. Robert Gluck, um, he, he helped me out, like, learn how to, like, do certain kinds of media. Like, um, like during my high school year, I was, like, doing camera work, but I didn't know about editing that time until I had help from one of his assistants, actually, from school, actually. But... So yeah, I, I used to learn, but then that time I was like doing Final Cut Pro, but then when I interned at Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, Jonathan Novick here, here was t taught me how to like do Premiere Pro, actually, and... John, you're a film editor? Yes. <laughs> yep. It's all thanks to him, actually. <laughs> so when I worked at a public, so it's now that I start working at a um, at a public relations program, at Slonsky and Partners, there was some, there was like, well, during the interview, like, I, I almost forgot what key, like, how to cut, and like, they just told me to just click on it, but then suddenly I remembered what, it, and it, and they were like, wow, I didn't know that that you can cut like that. I didn't know. What it was, and like, and like, they started learning the things that you taught me. Yeah. And John, what does it mean for you to be able to represent yourself, like in the film you made about mm -hmm. being a dwarf, getting mm -hmm. around New York City, um, and teaching others yeah. to be able to speak in their own voices with their own words, describing their own challenges? I think that it is a very cathartic experience. I think um, being able to empower people with disabilities, without disabilities, to voice their, you know, issues that they're having, experiences that they're having, and really put a lot of energy and effort into their, their craft. Which brings us to you, John Alpert, uh, the whole purpose of DCTV, of downtown community television, uh, in this old hundred-year-old firehouse down right near Ground Zero. Yeah, September 11th, yes, the firehouse opened to help people. Democracy Now! was there at that time. Um, this converted firehouse, what your dream is for it, this place you've built for decades? I think it's to give opportunities to everybody, uh, people of all different types of income, all different racial backgrounds, born in different places, people with all different types of abilities. And it's the same thing that you're doing. You have us on the show. We're all doing this together because we understand the power of media. Uh, we understand that it can be a great equalizer and level the playing field. You're doing it every day, and we appreciate it. Well, we want to thank you all for being with us. Uh, John Alpert is the director of All for One, and uh, John Novick and Ben Rosloff, uh, we follow you on your journey to Moscow as um, you join with filmmakers with disabilities in both places, large group of people, to examine the challenges uh, that you face from Moscow to New York can City. Ben sing? Can you sing your song? Um, ben, can you sing? I didn't know you could. Ben's a great singer. You know, can I just say, Ben was, what, what play were you in? You were in The Tempest? Uh, oh, yeah. I was in William Shakespeare's final play called The Tempest, actually, in <laughs> when I was, like, in Epic Players, actually. This was at the Egg Theater. This is a very prestigious off-Broadway. And, mm -hmm. and what was your part? Um, for Prince Ferdinand, and actually, the name of the theater was actually called the Flea Theater. The Flea, sorry, the Flea. <laughs> yeah. See, I, see, I can't. Ben remembers things I yeah, can't. Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I know. Um, sometimes we we make mistakes about certain names or where we are. But yeah, I was um, I was Prince Ferdinand, it, the son of King Alonso in the country Naples, which is in Italy, which, which is in Italy actually. And yeah, I, I got so yeah. So now it was first. It was camera work that I did, which is filming, second, editing, and now acting. It's all the three that I'm doing right now. Wow. So do you want to uh, take us out with a song? Sure. I will do so right, at, right now. Okay. <clears throat> Don't lose your way with each passing day. You've come so far. Don't throw it away. Live believing, dreams are for weaving, wonders are waiting to start. Live your story, faith, hope, and glory, hold to the truth in your heart. If we hold on together, I know our dreams will never die. Dreams see us through to forever, where clouds roll by for you and I. All right. Well, there you have Ben Rosloff, singer, actor, editor, filmmaker. John Novick. Um, I don't know about your singing abilities, oh, yeah. but uh, go around the table. Do you want to sing oh, something? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, is a filmmaker and also uh, does community outreach for the Office of Disabilities in New York City. Um, and John Alpert, founder, with his wife Keiko Tsuno of DCTV, Downtown Community Television, and great Emmy Award-winning filmmaker. This latest film is called All for One, and it premieres to tonight here in New York at the Albert Maisel's Theater. I'm Amy Goodman. To see part one of this discussion, go to democracynow.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.